Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the paranormal. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, we are speaking with Dr. Francis Young. Dr. Young is an historian, author, and translator, hailing from and with a particular interest in East Anglia. He joins us today to speak principally about the history of exorcism. Dr. Young, welcome aboard. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, I, uh, let's see how question the first goes, Francis. Were you a weird kid? Yes, well, I know you ask uh, all your uh, uh, contributors this question. Um, yes, I think I probably was r- a rather weird kid. Yeah, um, I was, uh, I suppose, yes, lived in my head um, and had a rich imaginative life. Um, I became very preoccupied, I suppose, when I was about 10 or 11 years old with folklore and fairy tales. And I used to collect uh, volumes of folklore um, stories from uh, any country, really, uh, around the world that I was fascinated by. And um, I did, uh, yes, I I did uh, uh, have a lot of interest in the unseen world, I suppose. Were you living in a, uh, did you grow up in a particularly folkloric area to use it as a sort of geographic descriptor? Yes, well, I grew up in in Suffolk, in East Anglia, in the the far east of of England, and that's an area that does have a very rich folklore. Um, Perhaps what it's best known for is the the great witch hunts that were conducted in the 17th century by Matthew Hopkins, the witch finder general. So there was, yes, always that sort of dark, looming background. And of course, the ghost stories of M.R. James. Um, In fact, where I went to school was only about a mile away from where James uh, was brought up at Great Livermere. And so I was always very much aware of those stories. And in a weird kind of way, I suppose my my life has has somewhat mirrored James's um, in that uh, we were both brought up in the same sort of area, had a similar kind of academic background, similar academic interests, but also a a lingering fascination with the supernatural. And um, was that, I mean, you just, you uh, gave yourself and Emma James as examples. I mean, was that fairly common? If you grew up in Suffolk, are you uh, steeped in it, or were you very specifically <laughs> the kid who was interested in that stuff? I think a lot of people in Suffolk are just not aware of this stuff. Um, I don't think it's quite the same as places like Wales and Cornwall, where there, there is much more an Ireland where there's much more of a public awareness generally um, of folklore and the supernatural. I think it's more of a specialised interest. Um, but, um, yes, I, I think I probably stood out for having those interests. Did, uh, did any of this reading lead to, um, supernatural events growing up? I mean, did you grow up in a haunted house in Suffolk, for instance? <laughs> no, nothing like that. Um, although I, I do recall one very strange event, um, when a, a tree, uh, in my school was struck by lightning. And uh, it was a a redwood tree. So when it uh, split open, it was actually one of the tallest trees in England. When it split open, it revealed this this odd flesh-like wood in the interior. And um, for for some reason, which I I, I can't explain why I did it, I took home a piece of of wood from, from this, which just came off because of the lightning strike. And I fashioned and whittled it into a small human figure and hid it under the floorboards in my home. And uh, I've no idea why I did this, um, but uh, I, I suppose looking back on it, it's one of those primitive ritualistic things which children often do, which hark back to, uh, yes, a, a, a sort of very basic understanding of trying to capture something of the force of the lightning in a magical way, perhaps. Yeah, I um, I occasionally refer to us as Homo Ritualis. I think there's something in in it yes. and and that sort of sets us apart. Uh, well, not entirely apart because it appears that Denisovans and Neanderthals um, also had ritual. But uh, it, you can, for kids especially, you can uh, observe what a, a a kind of natural interaction with a living universe looks like. Uh, because, I mean, I was just thinking in my head, I'm sure if that had happened today, given that there are more people who are sort of practicing occultists, I'm sure a, a dozen or so witches would have descended on the... Um, nearby witches would have descended on the schoolyard because that's uh, that's good wand wood if it's been, if it's yes. been struck by lightning. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So this there wasn't a... Um, uh, it doesn't appear then that there was a prodigal son relationship with, um, you know, 
with ritual and uh, and and folkloric research and so on did you know pretty much from a young age yes i am going to specialize in this and that's what i'm going to do as a job well i think that the fascination with ritual is something which came a little bit later um i mean really it it, it, it it's something that started when i was at university and uh, i and a, a group of friends we used to meet around key ritual moments in the, in the year particularly midsummer's eve um and uh, uh, midwinter eve and um i was the one who was who was asked to kind of design these uh, these these rituals for the for the group and um so i yeah so i would sort of construct rituals that largely drew on medieval festive celebrations they they didn't have a they didn't have a magical or occult element because that wasn't something that i was particularly um into at that at that time at least not overtly um but uh, yes i've always always been fascinated by the way in which ritual can enact belief in in a way that i don't think anything else can and i think that ritual you know you use the phrase human beings as homo ritualis. And I think that ritual is a basic aspect of what it is to be human. It's something that we all do, whether we admit it to ourselves or not. And it's one of the modes, along with writing and speech and music, by which we articulate our identity and our beliefs. Yeah, and I think there's probably something uh, structurally, structurally psychological about it because uh, it kind of reminds me of the um, amblicus and, and debates around the- theurgy, right? Because uh, if we talk to work out how we think, and that's sort of um, a cognitively safe statement that that is, it, it goes in that direction rather than the other direction. There is something in the performative capacities of ritual that is that's related to it. We um, we we ritualize to work out either how we think or, or how we how we frame the universe or something maybe not as as profound as that but uh, there, there's sort of performative cognition going on and I do think it's fundamental. Absolutely, no, I think it's it's a way of uttering the unutterable. Um, and uh, yes, I mean Jan Blykus is is trying to explain and is is trying to apply language to the ineffable. But actually, I think Jan Blykus was very well aware that ultimately it was in the, the ancient Egyptian rituals that fascinated him. It was there that the, the, the true meaning was conveyed more effectively than he was able to in his treatises, although he tries. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the idea that, you know, um, is, is faith sufficient in the early, early Christian church? And he comes down on, no, it's not. There actually does need to be a performative component of it. And I think, you know, he was correct. Well, not necessarily yes. him, but like the, that um, theurgy faith debate in, in Neoplatonism, I think he's correct. I think there's a performative component of it. And here we are, whatever that is, 1500 years later, and, uh, and there's some sort of cognitive science backing him up. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, not forgetting the fact that many of the the real heavyweights of early Christianity are coming out of mystical traditions, out of Neoplatonist traditions. That's where their intellectual background comes from. And although they they may have outwardly disavowed those uh, those, those mysteries by converting to Christianity, they're still the intellectual and the spiritual and the cultural products of that world. I mean, you only have to look at uh, Augustine. And the huge influence that his Manichaeanism continues to exert over his intellect long after he becomes a Christian. Yeah, I tried to convey that. We did a grimoire course at the end of, well, during Q2 of this year, and trying to convey the worldview at the time, because particularly if you're in sort of an American, you come from an American Protestant background, um, it's maybe not immediately obvious that these things weren't disavowed because they didn't work. Um, it, Neoplatonism was kind of like the new scientist subscription of the day. Like it's a, it's a sort of best practice, as far as we can tell, a best practice, but invitational description of how the universe functions. So it's not like, well, this is all wrong. <laughs> I'm doing the other thing. It, um, they, they were swimming in it and, and trying to get your head around where that is. And with Augustine as well, I like that he, um, he specifically calls out the things that he, no longer does anymore like going to the theater and and checking the stars and and they're also like checking the stars is basically 
checking the news on Twitter. So like it's oh, yeah. it, that's the the sort of point that he's making is like no 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 I've I've had this conversion and and this is basically all you need. But looking at it backwards, you can you can build the belief system that they're in, which is th- these the stars are like checking the news on Twitter and and Neoplatonism is like this is not as we view it as a philosophy in the 21st century, like this is how the universe works. That's what, that's what they thought it was. Yes, absolutely. I think it was, a, a, as you say, it was a kind of vernacular understanding, a sort of, um, yes, a sort of uh, scientific coine, if you can use the word scientific at that early stage. And I think the important thing to remember about Christianity is that it was a religious change but it wasn't a cultural change to the same extent. So these people still have to explain the workings of the world. They can't rely on a fundamentalist reading of the Bible in order to do that. And um, yes, I mean, many things change with the arrival of Christianity, but I would say that more stays the same, really. Well, yeah, I've... um... The god of early Christianity is is Greco Egyptian Judean rather than the god of the uh, Old Testament for this reason. They're they're, they're trying to in, uh, it has to work in the worldview, um, and and you sort of come out of the apologetics with this um, frame that allow, that allows it to work in the worldview rather than be a, a completely separate belief system. And I, I think in again because you know eighteen hundred. 1600 more years happened um that really interesting moment of 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 how you sort of integrate it into a best practice understandings of of the universe is uh sometimes glossed over yes yes absolutely right well speaking of um the early church uh one of your was it last year the exorcism book came out last year yes so question uh first question about exorcism i suppose is what even am exorcism uh, well, exorcism, in terms of the etymology of the word, you're actually going back to an ancient Greek word, which is exorcisdo, um, and that's a compound uh, from the word horkos, meaning an oath. So when you exorcise in the strict sense of the term, what you're doing is invoking the power of a deity in order to accomplish something. Now, in the original sense of that word, it was effectively invoking the power of a deity to punish you if you broke your oath. Um, the, the ancient Greeks, as you know, were very keen on the idea of, 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 of binding oaths involving deities, like many ancient cultures. Um, so, yes, I mean, in its most basic sense, an exorcism would be to invoke divine power in order to accomplish some theurgic act. Which is why it's um, it's very interesting that when this gets transferred into Latin, we have the word exorcisdo, which is just a direct borrowing of the Greek, but we also have a Latinization of it, which is the word coniuro, from which we get the word conjure. And conjuration, now, its main meaning would be magic rather than any kind of ecclesiastical activity. And in fact, it's impossible to distinguish in any meaningful conceptual way between conjuration that is done by ritual magicians and exorcism that is done by Christian clergy. The two are the self-same identical activity, although numerous attempts have been made over the centuries by the church to try and distance itself from the, the magical meaning of that term. Yeah, and uh, I learned from you and your books that um, the word conjurer is is first used in in a sort of uh, exorcistic uh, context, rather than what we might you know recognize today, or at least from the early modern period, as as a ritual magic use. And it's this it's a it's a map to that same shape. So you identify with a particular metaphysical being, and and temporarily. Um, assert or borrow its authority to um, to do something to make a change in the world or yes. yeah and and I, I find that interesting uh, on many levels but I think the the follow up question is then so this is a Greek word and it is to do with um, I guess managing oaths um, to start with but what is it about Christianity and exorcism specifically because it's been there from the beginning they they there's something about yeah. this they like and uh, and there's something about it that they did slightly different. 
Absolutely. Well, there's nothing particularly Christian about the practice of exorcism. It's been going on for as for as long as, as we have any form of historical records of any sort. We find it in the, the Greek magical papyri. Um, but what the Christians add to it is this belief, at least in the early church, that the name of Jesus is the most powerful, the supremely powerful, the only powerful name by which uh, uh, demons can be adjured. And so we have in the Acts of the Apostles, Paul and Peter exorcising people, I, I command you to depart in the name of Jesus and, and words, uh, words to this effect. So I think that in Christianity, the real significance of exorcism comes from this belief in the magical power of the name of Jesus. And I think this is something which is, is sort of glossed over in modern Christianity and modern Christians wouldn't use the word magical to describe the power that they attribute to the name of Jesus, although that's exactly what it is. Um, and yes, I, I, I think it, it's because Christianity wants to assert this new form of monotheism, which of course is not just any old monotheism, it's, it's exclusive monotheism. So, um, you know, not only is the God of Jesus Christ and the God who is Jesus Christ the greatest of the gods. He is the supremely great to the extent that the other gods are demoted to the status of demons. Um, that in order to assert this exclusivity, this exclusive monotheism, Christianity has to have a, a, a very direct and visible cultural mechanism by which to do that. And that's the power of the name of Jesus to banish demons. And of course, those demons are in the majority of cases thought to be possessing people. Now, the other thing to mention is that the, in inverted commas, exorcisms that are done by Jesus himself in the New Testament, strictly speaking, according to that definition of exorcism I just gave you, they're not exorcisms because Jesus doesn't adjure anyone by anything because he himself is portrayed in the New Testament as a divine figure. So he, he is, a, he is a, a deity and therefore he banishes spirits from people purely by his own power. He doesn't, he doesn't need a form of words by which to do it. So actually, they, they, they are, I would describe those as divine dispossessions rather than exorcisms. Exorcism in the early Christian sense, we only find it in the Acts of the Apostles. Do you think, I mean, this is sort of speculation because I've, I've briefly looked into this myself and, and I speculate this way. Uh, do you think there is a, there was a do as I do component to people reading that, those particular sequences where Jesus goes and bothers livestock with demons? Um, in, uh, in early Christian communities, because the um, expulsion of evil spirits is, is a f in a way, a form of medicine at the time. And do you think that these early Christian groups or even wandering preachers were um, sort of ghostbusters? Do you think there was actually a performative component? Because cr Christianity and expelling demons seems to be uh, um, peanut butter and jelly for our American listeners. Yes, I, I think that there is... There is certainly a, a, a an extent to which those who yeah those who were performing exorcisms in early Christianity, uh, as indeed many Christians do now, were adopting an analogical reading of Scripture. So, w you know what 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 I'm doing is analogous to what Jesus might have done. So it's the attempt to imitate Jesus. But of course, with the difference that if I go around exorcising people, I don't have a divine authority of my own. I only have this borrowed divine authority from Jesus, and hence the use of the adjuration, you know, in the name of or by the name of Jesus. Um, so, yes, I think there's always been that element to the Christian tradition. But interestingly, there's there's also often been dissent from that. So you've had people saying, well, just because Jesus exorcised, that's not a mandate for us to exorcise. So there is this skeptical tradition which says, um, you know, that was his prerogative because he was divine, but the church can make a decision about, you know, whether or not it's going to, isn't, it's going to do that. And I think I'm, I'm equally interested really in that tradition of, of skepticism, that rejection of exorcism, really because people are rejecting that analogical reading of scripture. And they're saying, well, actually, we don't have to mimic all the things that are done by people in the Bible. It's more about what the message of the Bible is. So, well, I mean, that's a good uh, point to segue. The book is uh, principally about uh, exorcism within a Catholic context. And uh, so we've sort of touched on the early metaphysics of how uh, 
um, exorcism, you know, quote unquote works, but, um, the theological metaphysics, I guess, uh, for the role of exorcism kind of change over time. So wh- what is that? What is, what is the theological, like, yeah, justification or metaphysics behind Catholicism early on and, and generally how does that change? Well, exorcism, wherever it's practiced and whenever it's practiced, is always underpinned by theology and by a particular branch of theology, which is, of course, demonology, the, the, the study of, of evil spirits and their nature, whether or not exorcists are willing to acknowledge that fact. And I think what we see is the development of, uh, of exorcism as a liturgical practice in the, uh, well, the beginning of the third century in Alexandria and Rome. So before that time, it's literally somebody turning up, believing they have a, a gift from the Holy Spirit to banish evil spirits. And they'll use whatever words come to them at the time, presumably some simple form of, of, of commanding in the name of Jesus. But as a result of the, the desire to integrate exorcism into the baptism of new converts to the Christian faith, you end up with specific formulas of exorcism being developed. And so it's that baptismal form of exorcism that starts first. And the other thing that arises around the same time is the idea of exorcising things rather than people. And that goes back to the fact that the church wanted to make sure that everything it used in its worship was restored to this pristine state, the state in which God created it. Because you have this idea, again, I think this can be traced to Neoplatonism, that after the fall, everything, not just human souls, but everything has been corrupted in some way by death. So what the church needs to do is to exorcise oil, salt, and water particularly, but it can apply to other, other stuff as well. And then you'll, then you'll bless them. So when we talk about holy water, for example, actually in the Catholic tradition, holy water has been exorcised first then blessed. So it, it's made holy by two processes. And uh, yeah, so, so we've got the exorcism of persons who are being baptized and the exorcism of, of objects. And that exorcism of persons makes a great deal more sense when it's mostly adults who are being baptized because these people would have been pagans. And therefore, in the eyes of the church, they would have been corrupted morally and spiritually by this allegiance to alien gods. What becomes a little bit stranger is when we have mostly infants being baptized um, and exorcised before their baptism. And then the question arises, well, you know, why are you exorcising these infants? Is it because you believe that they're somehow possessed by an evil spirit? Or is it just a ritualistic act that you're doing because that's the tradition and that's the liturgy? And I think we don't really have a, a straightforward answer to that question. No, well, uh, what I what I liked about it, I think uh, the the changes um, that I guess we're talking about is um, there was sort of a metaphysical step change in the Middle Ages between where um, the power of an exorcist came from. So beforehand, you you have a kind of ecstatic and saint based and and, and kind of like just generally unstructured magical base for you could yeah. use a relic to get rid of a demon. You could use what have you. And then um, exorcism. And this is what, one of the things I really enjoyed about the book is that uh, it's, it's a fascinating yardstick to kind of chart the metaphysical changes in Catholicism. But I mean, what was it in, in the middle ages that pivoted away from this more or less unstructured, uh, and far more animistic, I guess, use of, you know, bones and various saints to yeah. to kick things out. Yes, well, you've got two traditions throughout the Middle Ages existing in tandem, sort of par- parallel approaches. And, and one approach, as you say, is a sort of charismatic approach, which, yes, it, it, it might involve using uh, relics of saints, visits, pilgrimages to shrines of saints associated with exorcism. It might involve herbs and stones, which some church writers are prepared to allow. Uh, as a as a form of relief from demonic oppression, um, and at the same time, you've got this liturgical tradition, which develops out of that baptismal liturgy, but is also applied to enigumens, as they're known at the at the early stage, which is people who, after baptism, become afflicted by demonic phenomena, um, and you know later they would be known as demoniacs and possessed people. Um, but yes, in, 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 the, in the high Middle Ages, so as scholastic philosophy begins to develop, you then have a distinction made by Thomas Aquinas and others between sacraments 
and sacramentals. So sacraments are the, are the, are the big seven, you know, things like uh, the Eucharist, the consecration of bread and wine to become the body and blood of Christ, marriage, holy orders, the, you know, the great um, rituals of, of life in the church. And those things are defined by Aquinas as having their efficacy simply because of the words that are spoken. So when the priest speaks the words hoc est enim corpus meum over a piece of bread, then that is no matter what you know that that priest has been up to you know that that will happen that, that you know that there will be a, a a mysterious miraculous transformation on us on, on, on yeah of that bread and wine into the body and blood of christ but a sacramental is a lesser form of rite so it's something like the blessing of holy water for example or exorcism which is dependent for its effectiveness on the worthiness of the person who does it so that means that if a a morally unworthy priest attempts to conjure a demon, then that will actually, you know, that might not be effective. And I think that's a relic, that distinction is a relic of that way in which exorcism was thought of as something more of a charismatic gift. So whereas being a priest is not a charismatic gift, it's a kind of a legal status in the Roman Catholic Church, being an exorcist, well, that's something which Yes, it's only it's not for the faint hearted. It's for somebody who actually has a calling and a gift to that particular ministry. And it also it appears to have um, sort of exclusively formed around um, officialdom. So you you had to be a priest, which is, you know, legal. You had to be ordained anyway. uh, And you had to have that particular um, moral status. And then you're in a kind of sliding um, you can you can accumulate moral points, uh, and and then you can. It's almost like a computer game. Then, like you could, if I am X moral, I can um, expel these demons. Uh, because at the same time, not in the same process, and we'll talk about this now. Actually, um, initially, it wasn't strictly the devil, quote unquote, that was cast out during you know early exorcisms. That that happened over time as as the notion of the devil coalesced. Oh, yes. I mean, this is a very fascinating question of who exactly is being cast out. And I think when you look at the liturgy of baptism, because baptism includes this explicit renunciation of the the devil with a capital D, as it were. um, Yes, there is a sense in which it's the the, the devil being exorcised. But when you get to enigumens, these demoniacs, the 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 early liturgies speak of unclean spirits and of course that's the language that we also find in the new testament that jesus is not exorcising the devil himself with a capital d out of uh, out of these people the in fact the only person in the new testament who the devil is portrayed as entering is judas um none of the other demoniacs that jesus encounters are possessed by the devil and yet as time goes on you're quite right you get this idea that maybe the devil is possessing people, but there are theological problems with that because, according to some in- theological to interpretations, the, the 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 death and resurrection of Jesus means that the devil himself is bound in hell and therefore doesn't really have much freedom of action. And so, some theologians come to the conclusion that actually, no, all these possessions are by minor spirits, by unclean spirits that may be serving Satan, but they're not actually Satan himself. And I think actually, it's it's quite a modern idea, the idea that the devil himself is is the one who's usually possessing people who are supposed to be demoniacs. So, I mean, it, um, it unsurprisingly tracks the experience of the church through the Middle Ages, where there was in particular an 85-year period there, which was really, really bad with plagues and, and a papacy in exile and, and so on, and then, and then the rise of Protestantism, um, you you see the form of the devil coalesce because if you are on the other side of that fence, uh, it really does look like <laughs> it really does look like the devil has it in for Europe and the church, uh, and and it just seems I find that I mean that's expressed in in kind of changes in grimoires and so on, but I find that particular yes. rough patch fascinating that. Um, you begin kind of like with spirits, and then the church goes through a really, really bad patch, and uh, and it formulates as this sort of um, ultimate adversary to God. Yes, that's right. I think it all really begins with the rise of the of the Cathar heresy, uh, where you've got this this dualism in which the the reality of evil is is very strongly emphasized by the by the by the Cathars quite quite literally. Um, 
And I think the church has to respond to that. And it has it has to deal not just with the fact that, you know, the, the, the Cathars are in the eyes of the church unacceptable heretics, but by the fact that the Cathars had proved very, very attractive to a lot of people. And the church does that by really emphasizing this duality, um, not to the same extent as the Cathars, but to a much greater extent than than, than their two four, um, saying that, yes, the devil is real and the devil is active. And you see this at the, uh, the Fourth Lateran Council, where for the first time you get dogmatic statements on the devil at the beginning of the 13th century. And um, yes, you, you've got statements from popes in which the devil becomes ever more, ever more prominent. And um, yes, I think you're absolutely right that by the time of the Reformation, the devil has coalesced. And I think the, the, the reason for this is that the devil always becomes more culturally and religiously important at times of crisis, and especially at times of millennial expectations of, of, of apocalyptic um, beliefs. And of course, in the 16th century, as a result of the Reformation, and of the, the, the periods of turmoil and war then, you've got a lot of people believing that the end of the world is nigh. And if you believe that the end of the world is nigh, you're going to think that the devil has been loosed from his bondage and is alive and active in the world and doing bad stuff. And of course, one of the bad things that the devil is doing is possessing people and creating demoniacs. So uh, I know you, you touch on that in the book, but um, I, I think kind of wisely don't say this is what it's about necessarily but you mentioned that sort of millennial angst and 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 times of challenge for the church and uh and um that does potentially match with the um or is at least a factor or a vector in uh in the resurgence of um exorcism in modern day catholicism today so uh, i mean let's talk about that what 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 other factors is that a factor and are there other factors in in um in, I guess, exorcism's unexpected prominence in the 21st century? Most definitely. I mean, the, the, the argument of the book really is that there are two disposing factors uh, to, to a resurgence of exorcism, and these are true uh, whichever period of the church's history that you look at. And that's, um, first of all, this kind of apocalyptic belief that, you know, the world is, is, is close to its end. And secondly, the presence of some sort of enemy or threat uh, to, the, to the church. And, and we see this in the, in the Counter-Reformation, the Catholic Church's response to the Protestant Reformation, uh, which becomes absolutely obsessed with, with exorcism throughout the 16th and 17th centuries. And then we have a, a period in the 18th century where the age of reason and the, uh, the inroads of the Enlightenment mean that uh, exorcism really goes out of fashion in the 18th century, although it carries on on the outer fringes of the Catholic world, particularly in, uh, in, in, in colonial territories. But uh, yes, in the 19th century, particularly in the late 19th century, we get this resurgence. And it's very much associated with Pope Leo XIII. And I would argue that it's from Leo XIII that we can trace the, the contemporary revival of exorcism in the modern Catholic Church. Leo was somewhat paranoid in disposition, and he believed that there was an international conspiracy of Freemasons trying to take over the world and trying to undermine the church. And as a result of this, he becomes fascinated by demonology. Um, and in fact, he writes a, a very well-known exorcism, the exorcism against Satan and the apostate angels. But he also redirects the way exorcism is done. He turns it into something much more general. So the, that exorcism I mentioned is not an exorcism of a person. It's just a general repudiation of evil forces. And similarly, we get the prayer to St. Michael, uh, authored supposedly by Leo XIII. And uh, yes, what I mentioned earlier, this, this sense in which it is the devil himself, Satan with a capital S, who is seen as active in the world and possessing people. And when you look at um, uh, you know, famous possession accounts, um, perhaps the best known of all being the, uh, the, the, the possession of this, this boy known only as R, um, sometimes called Robbie, um, which, uh, which takes place, starts in St. Louis. Um, and of course, that turns into the basis of, of, of The Exorcist, the novel and the film. Um, that Yes, this sense in which Satan himself is, is active. And also this, this role that is often given in modern exorcism accounts to St. Michael uh, as the vanquisher of demons, um, and this sense in which the exorcist adopts this heroic role and is involved in a cosmic struggle. When you look at medieval exorcisms, that's now not how they're portrayed. They're portrayed almost as antiseptic uh, 
mm-hmm. healthcare. Yeah. Um, you know, something rather ordinary that might happen to anyone on any given day. They're not something which is a cosmic battle between good and evil. Yeah, uh, absolutely. That was, uh, I, I find that was one of the really fun things about the book for me was to, to kind of see the change of it over time because we look at uh, depictions of exorcisms in, in films and so on today. And I was unaware of just how comparatively recent that general shape uh, of, of it was. But uh, going back to the sort of 16th and 17th century, it's fascinating to look at this is sort of the other side of the coin to um the democratization of grimoires as they sort of enter vernacular languages and also witch trials isn't it so it's you, you kind of have to hold all three things in your head and to get a view of perhaps the world view um <laughs> of a catholic church at the time it's like the place is lousy with witches and protestants and there are demons everywhere and this has got yes. to be the devil Absolutely. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you've mentioned grimoires, because one of the things that I was very keen to emphasize, really, and I think it's very important for the history of magic, is to acknowledge that there are really three strands, three origins to uh, the, the ritual magic that we have from the Middle Ages in the grimoires. And one of those is the, in inverted commas, Jewish tradition of Solomonic magic. And then we've got the Arabic tradition of astral magic and then the third strand that forms the rope which i think has been a bit bit neglected until now is exorcism is liturgical exorcism because uh, you know there there are many uh, very influential grimoires like the the munich handbook that was edited by richard kiekeffer uh, which is basically an exorcism it's a, it's a manual of exorcism the only difference is that you've got those certain priests who decide to use their powers of conjuration, not just to banish demons, but also to summon demons, that's the only difference. So when you look at the Munich Handbook, it's identical to what you find in the Pontificals, the official liturgical manuals, but with the one difference that you've got the summoning of the demon as well as the banishing of the demon. But both exorcists in the church and conjurers in the you know in the back streets were, were were both using their power to compel demons to answer questions which of course is at the very heart of medieval ritual magic you you, you want to find out forbidden information by summoning spirits yeah the the theological mechanisms behind it are identical because you were mm. using and uh, i mean it these texts and the Munich handbook is a very good example of it are examples of the priestly underground. So you kind of do something you get ordained. So you are, you are literally in a magical line, believing this cosmology, um, going back to St. Peter. Um, so you, you, ha- you're given magical powers to, you know, arrange things like spirits in the universe and so on. So it's literally the same as a, you know, as a priest, in a direct and unbroken line to Jesus, I will move the, like the spirit can either go or it can arrive, but it's the same. The, the sort of authoritative shape is identical, which is unsurprising given the, the vector in which um, those documents appear in Europe is basically entirely ecclesiastical or priestly in an, in an underground sense. Yes, no, absolutely. And I think, Yes, it's very important to emphasize that this is one and the same tradition. Um, There's not, you know, church exorcism and magical exorcism. They're one and the same, and the people doing them are the same people, as you say. Yeah, well, I liked, uh, and I think it was surprisingly common. I mean, if you look at the the sort of earliest descriptions of people who went through which is, was the only school at the time, but sort of went through monastic schooling and then moved out. They're like, oh, yeah, my Latin teacher taught me how to see a demon in in the thumbnail of, of one of the students, and I couldn't yeah, do it. Salisbury. Yeah, <laughs> and, and you look at it and go, and, and that just seems like it must have been a quiet, wet afternoon in southern England. I say, hey, do you, do you want to see a demon? <laughs> it, it, um, it's really interesting that, you, although we don't have that many documents, you do get a sense that it was probably quite pervasive because this was one of the things that you got when you became a priest. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm boss of demons now. Yes, absolutely. And uh, Sophie Page has recently done some very interesting work on manuscripts that were in the library of St. Augustine's Abbey in Canterbury. And there you've got, um, you know, collections there 
of manuscripts which give instructions on how to create magical monsters um you know using some very uh, uh, sort of dark dark techniques of uh, of magical vivisection um so yes it's it's astonishing really what was in some of these monastic libraries for those who chose to go in that direction and um I, this sort of splits i suppose around things like um you know uh, a reformation or two or um henry the 8th or what have you but uh when, did this stop? When did this continue? Uh, or did this continue rather? I mean, I know, for instance, in um, I come from a Catholic family, and I know that uh, my um, grandmother squinted somewhat at Vatican II and, uh, and those changes. So Catholicism, as, as does Anglicanism, I guess, there is an undercurrent of uh, extreme traditionalists. So as far as you can tell, like, when did, uh, when did the kids in seminary stop bothering demons? That's a that's a good question. I, 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 there's there's very little evidence that once the training of priests was was reformed. This is after the the, the Council of Trent, which starts in 1542, so middle of the 16th century. After the training of priests is reformed, and you have the seminary system instituted with dedicated colleges for the training of priests, there's very little evidence. That you get uh, that you get many of those priests dabbling in the dark arts. I think it's it, it's because the the earlier system was almost a system of informal apprenticeship, and that would lend itself to that kind of experimentation. Whereas the seminaries were often run by the Jesuits, who although they prided themselves on their deep knowledge of demonology, the Jesuits were were, were not uh, were not keen on uh, yes more experimental necromancy. Um, <laughs> a little light other, necromancy, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, but on the other hand, what you do find is a much greater spread of this kind of knowledge amongst the laity after the Reformation. And that's partly to do with the growth of literacy. It's partly to do with the fact that some of these texts are being translated into vernaculars out of Latin. And um, I think also because in England in particular, uh, you've got a, a sort of network of underground priests after the Reformation who were ordained in Henry's time or in Mary's time, uh, but they're they're lingering on to sort of the the early 17th century in some cases, and you know these these are guys with no way of supporting themselves financially other than by being enterprising, and so what you do find in in quite a few cases is priests behaving badly by uh, you know acting as cunning men effectively as 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 sort of low grade wizards um and offering to do magic maybe love magic maybe uh, magic to find stolen goods for people um and so yes i think it lingers on and, and, it, and it becomes a more socially marginal phenomenon than it was in the middle ages in the middle ages i think the yes it's a it's a it's it's a, it's an underground, but it's a it's an elite underground because it's primarily clergy that are doing this. But what you find in England, certainly after the Reformation, is that it's it's becoming more socially diverse. Yeah, the English experience uh, fascinates me because you have um, well, he would go on to be James the Fourth, but James the First rather. But you have uh, um, the idea that witchcraft as an old religion is essentially this sort of rogue Catholicism appears to be in in the in the heads of uh, of people at the time. I mean, I, in uh, Cambridge Book of Magic, for instance, which I remember I telling you, I think I told you, one of my, it was my favorite book of the year or one of them in twenty fifteen. Yes, but, but you have like um, when you start to see the use of things like priest holes in these books, you you realize that it, it as the vector goes from sort of like officialdom to like dirty wizard, which is amazing. Uh, it is this weird mixture of, um, and, and you can tell because they need things like you need to have a Catholic priest or, or, or a priest of Rome um, to do this particular ritual or to do this thing. And in, in your head, you're starting to picture these, yeah, rogue Catholics using um, all the stuff in the bottom drawer of Catholicism against the king and the king's writing these books about demonology. And there's this kind of fascinating English uh, magic war, I guess, going on at the time. Yes, most certainly. I mean, yes, I have a, a book coming out um, in September, uh, which is called Magic as a Political Crime in Medieval and Early Modern England. And um, yes, I mean, that's essentially on, on, that, on that subject about how people use three main ways of, of trying to harm or kill uh, 
or affect the judgment in some cases of, of, of the monarch by magic. And, and, and one of those is by attempting to poison. Poisoning, of course, was considered an occult activity in, until fairly recently. Um, and one other method is by astrological calculations. And sometimes that ast astrological element is allied with prophecy. And sometimes it's also allied with the most basic way of using magic to kill the monarch, which is by making effigies. Uh, but this isn't necessarily the, uh, yes, the sort of the, the, the straightforward voodoo doll method. This is, this is something a bit more sophisticated, which means making an effigy at a particular astrological hour, um, following the prescriptions of grimoires, which in many cases do contain um, information information about effigy magic. And so, yes, we, we, we get a, a tradition of dissent against the monarch, which really reaches fever pitch in the 16th century with the Reformation, when you've got Catholics associated in the mind of, of the government with religious conservatism, but also with superstition. And so the, 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 the suspicion always alights upon Catholics whenever something like this is found. And um, at the same time, the Catholics are deeply resentful of this because you know, the church officially um, completely uh, dissociates itself from this sort of dark magic. Um, but at the same time, it's quite clear that within, I suppose, the the, the traditionalist community, uh, the traditionalist underground in 16th century England, there are people who are prepared to use pretty much any means to get there, to get their way. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm very much looking forward to the book. I just think it, it's interesting to see how magic in a way is, how to describe this, I guess, uh, it's almost like a hidden or deep state science. It's like the proverbial flying saucer, because you have Elizabeth, um, there, there are people around Elizabeth using it, uh, and they use it because, you know, we got some stuff going on, <laughs> uh, whatever else, ca she was obviously personally interested in it, but it's almost like having mad scientists in the background, like, okay, what else can you get me? And, and I yes. find that, I find that really, uh, Interesting because it casts a long shadow in the, the English experience casts a long shadow in the history of magic. Uh, and, and a big part of it is this, um, sort of, yes, post Henry the eighth, um, closing in the monasteries, which as with, um, Cambridge book of magic, presumably dumped a whole lot of, um, texts that, um, maybe should have been kept in the monastery out into a populace. Yes. And, uh, and then the change in, in how people see and why they use it, um, it's, is really, really, I guess, unique in the story of, you know, magic. Yes. Uh, I mean, obviously the English experience is, is what I've specialized in. Um, so, you know, that's what I, that's what I know most about, but I think it's intriguing the way in which Elizabeth is prepared to use counter magic, uh, or at least countenance the use of, of counter magic against those whom she believes is uh, are trying to kill her by magic. We have one particular incident in the summer of 1578 when John D, uh, the, 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 the best known magician of that era is called upon by Elizabeth to perform some sort of counter magic. And we don't know exactly what it is, although I, I offer some, uh, some educated guesses in the book as to what it might be that he did in order to counter a curse that she believes has been, has been made against her through the making of wax effigies. And that turns into, yes, a, 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 almost a full-blown magical war. It turns into an extensive witch hunt that spreads throughout the country that lasts for several years. Um, and, and yes, there is this sense in which it's not just on one side. It's not just those with dark intentions against the government. It's also potentially the government using this kind of stuff, not publicly, but secretly, uh, to, to counter supernatural threats. Yeah, it, uh, and this is around the time, well, not exactly, but, um, just, I guess, pulling it back briefly to exorcism, um, as the, as, a, as the status of, um, I guess, priests or the metaphysics behind priestliness change, uh, in, in different places around Europe, exorcism in some instances becomes like a form of miraculous healing almost. Yes, I think so. I, I, I think, well, obviously, you've got the, the Reformation destroying shrines, uh, destroying relics, but also you've got the, the Counter-Reformation, which downplays uh, some of those elements of Catholicism. And uh, the, the, the Counter-Reformation is much more about orienting people towards a hierarchical church 
in which they're obedient to the Pope and the bishops and their parish priest, uh, rather than, you know, preoccupied with going on pilgrimage to such and such a famous shrine. Although those things still exist, they're, they're, they're not uh, emphasized as much in the Counter-Reformation. So what you really get within Catholicism from the 16th century onwards is this focus on the figure of the exorcist priest. And that's something you don't find so much in the in the Middle Ages. And yes, there's a personality cult in some cases around these these figures. Perhaps one good example would be Jean-Joseph Serin, who is the um, the exorcist who is eventually called in to deal with the outbreak of mass possession amongst nuns at Loudun in France, the Devils of Loudun uh, incident. Um, and that was in 1634. And of course, Surin eventually enters into this cosmic battle with the demon who is possessing uh, Mother Jeanne des Anges, who is the, the prioress, and makes this sacrifice of himself and invites the, the devil to enter him so that he takes upon himself her possession. And, and, and this this stuff is is all new. I mean, this is completely unprecedented in the history of exorcism. And it's this kind of extreme piety is being applied to what was a, you know, an ancient practice that tr traditionally was done in quite a different way. Yeah, it's, uh, I love this kind of stuff. I, lo I love hearing about it. Uh, yeah. And, and to, I guess, see the change in the mechanics and, and, and metaphysics of these practices and what they imply for how we conceived of magic over the last 1800 years and how that's changed. Uh, but it, it, speaking of things that have changed, uh, the last year or so, I have been really enjoying watching your um, sort of Edmund share fest on, on Twitter and, 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 learning, ah. and, <laughs> and learning more and more. So um, we will, I would love to talk about this briefly. Uh, who is the Edmund in question that we're talking about? Uh, so this is uh, Edmund, who was king of the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of East Anglia, the last king of East Anglia, um, who was killed by invading Vikings in 869, uh, famously tied to a tree and shot with arrows. And uh, this is, a yes, a, another area of, of my research. A lot of my research that's not about exorcism and magic is focused on uh, the, the, the history of the, of the, of the region that I, that I come from, East Anglia, which I feel a, a deep... To, uh, sort of spiritual and cultural tie with that uh, with that area, and Edmund is the, is considered to be the patron saint of, of East Anglia, and um, really uh, I've become involved over the last few years with the the possibility that it might be um, it might be about time that we discover uh, the burial place of of Edmund because he like many other. Um, Anglo-Saxon saints who were buried in great monasteries, in his case at Bury St Edmunds in Suffolk, um, was mysteriously reburied at, at the time of the dissolution of the monasteries, and we don't know exactly where. Um, but I have come across interesting new evidence which might allow us to uncover that burial site, rather like the um, uh, a few years ago, the evidence that allowed the burial site of Richard III to be identified. Um, so I, I can't make any promises that, <laughs> that it's going to happen, but I think it, it could potentially be on the cards. Yeah, I think that's a uh, good quest. Uh, Edmund is an interesting example, I suppose, of that sort of weird mix of, of saints and, and kingship where you have particularly in, I was going to say Dark Ages Britain, but there's, there's loads of them and he's maybe the exemplar of the, um, the combination of, of saint and king. Uh, and I mean, talk us through that. Is, is he the first? Have I got that right? Is he the first that we know? Uh, no, he's not first. I think the, 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 that honour would have to go to Osby of Northumbria. Um, but uh, yes, there's a number of them in, in Anglo-Saxon history, but some are venerated more than others, and it's unclear exactly why. But essentially, you've got this new form of sainthood, which has to develop in the northern world. As the northern world is converted to Christianity from paganism, uh, it, you know, it's not, it's not like the conversion of St. Augustine in which, you know, it's an it's a individual spiritual struggle for highly intellectual pagans to decide whether they want to become Christians. It's more about barbarian kings making the decision about whether they're going to bring their kingdom into the Christian fold. And of course, some of these kings, when they become Christians, they then have a conflict with a pagan neighbor and they get killed. Well, should they be considered a martyr? They're not a martyr in the traditional sense because they didn't make a conscious choice to die for the Christian faith. 
but the church is willing to accept that yeah we probably should make these people martyrs because it will encourage other people to become christians and so it's a, it's a sort of business decision on the part of the church that's going to do this and edmund is perhaps the most egregious example because th- there's a great mystery at the heart of the edmund story we don't know why Edmund died. We don't know why the Vikings killed him. Um, I mean, was was he simply killed in battle because he was an enemy king? Was he killed because the Vikings didn't like the Christian faith? Well, that doesn't seem to sit very well with the surviving evidence that we have about the Vikings. So yes, it's a it's an unsolved mystery, really. We know we know who killed him, and we know that he died, but we just don't know the the true motive. Is there talking about the sort of northern experience of of sainted or martyred um, kings and chieftains? Is at least part of that a uh, a survival of the sort of pre Christian? At least part of it is it at least a survival of I guess a pre Christian conception that uh, you know this this spirit of a chieftain or powerful warrior is contactable after death and and interested in the the future of with the future well-being of a tribal group? I think that's certainly a, a distinct possibility. I think it's hard to, to, to prove. Um, but I think when we find Edmund having his head cut off, every time that we come across a decapitation in the British Isles, uh, in, in myth and history, you always have to ask the question whether that's uh, spiritually significant, because, of course, there is that um, ancient British tradition of head worship, of the belief that um, the, the, the virtue of a, and strength of an enemy is contained within the head, and that the cutting off of the head is not an entirely negative and destructive act. It may be a way of actually preserving that head to provide um, uh, m- mystical and occult knowledge, uh, rather like uh, Roger Bacon's brazen head. Um, so I think uh, there's certainly that possibility. I think also the way in which you've got an animal involved in the story of Edmund, which is associated traditionally with, with the god Woden or Odin, which is the, the wolf who protects the, the head of Edmund. There is this sense in which when you put all of the mythology and all of the iconography together, there's almost a shadowy sense in which Edmund is continuing that sacred kingship that comes from Woden, and Edmund himself claimed descent from from Woden in a Christianized form, admittedly. But there is a yes, I think I think that it's more likely than not that you've got some sort of echoes there, perhaps not even understood by the people at that time. These echoes of a, of an earlier pre-Christian past. But you really get the temptation, or you really understand the temptation of those early 20th century antiquarians to get very literalist with this stuff, because it's so, you can smell it, like, there's something yeah. here. <laughs> there's something yeah. here we, we have to keep a level head with yeah. this stuff, and and yes, it's it's only ever going to be speculative. But um, yes, I mean, some, some examples are much more extreme than others, like, for example, the, the, the ritual dismemberment of Oswald of Northumbria, another of the great martyr kings is even more suggestive than what happened to Edmund. So, yes, I mean, there, there, is, there is mileage for speculation. Yeah, absolutely. Well, my personal favourite uh, decapitation in Britain, which is uh, St. Winifred. Ah, oh, yes, indeed. Well, I mean, that's on Welsh territory, so you're there most definitely within the, within the British tradition of, uh, of yeah, the, that, that Celtic tradition of, of decapitated heads. Yeah. Um, what an excellent place to uh to begin winding up the conversation decapitated heads so uh dr young for people who want to know more about this stuff about exorcism and uh and the upcoming book and and edmund things and and all the rest uh what should they do where should they go uh, well i have a blog uh, which is francis young uh, dot wordpress dot com uh, or you can follow me on Twitter, uh, where I'm usually tweeting something obscure about the history of East Anglia or the history of magic, uh, where my Twitter handle is at Suffolk Recusant. Wonderful. And this stuff will be in the show notes as uh, as well as um, pointing to the books. But uh, this has been great. I've, I really, really enjoyed, well, I obviously enjoyed Cambridge Book of Magic, and, and I don't know if you intended for it to be practically used, but it has been. <laughs> <laughs> I take no responsibility yeah. for any practical use. <laughs> yeah, very good. And uh, and the Exorcism book was, was uh, hugely useful and, and enlightening in, in, I guess, um, arranging a lot of my thinking and, and, and filling out context for the story of magical books in Europe. So uh, I was looking forward to this chat. And um, 
and thank you very much. Well, thank you, Gordon, and it's been a great pleasure and an honour to appear on Rune Soup. Headlessness, exorcism, and dead kings. Motifs that should be at least passingly familiar to regular listeners. If you want to know more, be sure to check out the publications page at Dr. Young's site, linked up in the show notes. And if you're looking for a text that captures some of the uh, tension of the early English Protestant era, pick up his Cambridge Book of Magic, a Tudor Necromancer's Manual, which made it onto my best books of the year in 2015. And beyond that, for more of all this kind of malarkey, be sure to subscribe to the show on YouTube or in your favourite podcatcher, and or find me on Twitter where I am Gordon, G-O-R-D-O-N underscore white, W-H-I-T-E. Until next time.